Good evening, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Daniela Murian, one, and I'm one of the specialists uh, who, together with other um, 19 colleagues, decided to join together the forces and organize a series of uh, webinars which are uh, free for you. Uh, tonight, we will have um, um, an internal medicine specialist, uh, Robert Fall. Rob Fall. Uh, but before presenting him, I would like to um, show you uh, or show to those that uh, are joining us for the first time our program. So we have organized a total of uh, 19 uh, webinars, um, which uh, by now um, will be, I think, 23 or 24, because there are new um, specialists joining us and there are um, every day um, new colleagues that are asking to join us and support us in this initiative. So we are Vets for Ukraine uh, 2022. And the um, calendar for this week is pretty rich. So we will have webinars every day, starting from today with Rob Fall, uh, talking about the uh, feline and diabetic. Tomorrow we will have uh, a surgeon, we will have John La Jane Ludlow. Jane Ludlow, um, uh, I think most of you will know her because she is um, particularly dedicated to uh, the research into the brachycephalic uh, obstructive uh, airway syndrome. And after Jane Ladlow, Ladlow we will have another medic, um, Professor Steen Neeson from the Royal Veterinary College, uh, talking about Cushing's and the tools that we have to make the diagnosis of Cushing, followed by Sandra, Sandra Guilen, um, she, uh, who is uh, an oncologist, and Sandra will talk about the clinical approach to cutaneous subcutaneous masses. <clears throat> On the 1st of April, we will have Renata, uh, Renata St uh, Stavinova, uh, who is an ophthalmologist, and she will talk about corneal uh, ulcerative disease in dogs. And uh, finally, we will have Kelly Blacklock from the University of Edinburgh on the 3rd of April, talking about some uh, basics of the oncological surgery. Um, I would like to now share with you a nice video that Jane Ladlow has uh, sent to us um, where she presents herself and uh, she uh, does a nice uh, presentation of the speaker of tonight, Rob Fall. Paolo, please, can you share the video of Jane? Hi, my name is Jane Ladlow and I am a soft tissue surgeon. I'm delighted to be introducing Rob Foll's talk this evening, which is on feline diabetes. So Rob Foll is an internationally renowned medic, veterinary medic, and he not only set up and led the medicine department of Dick White Referrals, but he also led Dick White Referrals for a number of years. Um, he will be incredibly interesting on this very pertinent topic, which is becoming unfortunately more frequent, and I shall be listening and hoping that I can improve my medical knowledge somewhat. Obviously, this is an um, important webinar series because we are trying to raise funds for our Ukrainian friends and colleagues. Um, there are no real words to describe what is happening in Ukraine at the moment. It is truly devastating, and I think we're all hoping, hoping for a peaceful resolution. Um, unfortunately, we still need lots and lots of money so we can help Ukraine rebuild and support our friends and colleagues. So please do donate, and I hope you enjoy this webinar as much as I'm sure I will. Thank you. Yes, Jane, thank you very much for this nice introduction and, and also for um, reiterating our appeal. So um, this is uh, the appeal that Jane made is very important and uh, it is also important that we reach as many as, pos as people as possible and that you uh, please click on the link www.justgiving.com slash vets for Ukraine to make your donation. Remember, every little helps so even if are just few pounds or few euros please do do donate because um we can make the difference um if you um 
want to, or if you wish to be uh, a little bit more part of this initiative, you can follow my example. So yesterday was a sunny day here in the UK, and I uh, recorded a video message uh, for you, which I posted on already on our Facebook page, but I just would like to um, show it to you again. Um, because uh, I thought that maybe to uh, join all our forces together and to uh, uh, raise our, our voice better, we could um, all organize like a white t-shirt and a marker pen and just do something like, like that. So I just need to stand up. So you just take a white t-shirt, a black marker pen, and you just write tag vets for ukraine 2022 and then if you want you can just take a photo and post the photo on um, on your uh, social media so let's see the video that i've recorded yesterday hi everyone i'm daniela murja from vets for ukraine 2022 and i'm a small animal surgeon the reason for my message to you today is because I would like to let you know that our Facebook group Vetonea has now reached a thousand adhesions and I would like therefore thank you from the deep of my heart for your support, for your help, for being with us, for helping us, helping the people in Ukraine. Please uh, keep, keep, keep supporting each initiative that you might find online or everywhere to support uh, Ukrainian people and in particular to support our veterinarian colleagues in Ukraine. To, um, to boost uh, a little bit our campaign, we would like again to ask you to spread the word wide and far everywhere to your parents, to your family, to your colleagues, to your friends, to your into the university uh, in the veterinary clinics where you are working please do that because it's very important that we reach as many people as possible in order also to collect as many donations as possible so now if you want to feel a little bit more part of this great initiative uh, just find like a, an old t-shirt a t-shirt simply a t-shirt and a couple of marker pens or simply a, a black marker pen and write our message and post it on your social media post it on linkedin on facebook on instagram on twitter wherever just post it like i will do so dear friends and colleagues here i'm back again and in the meantime, I made this t-shirt. It took me like 10 minutes to do it and it was super easy. You just need a white t-shirt and a marker pen. Follow me, do your t-shirt, post it on your social media and let's support Vets for Ukraine 2022 all together. Cari amici italiani, uh, questa è uh, la maglietta che ho appena fatto, ci ho messo 10 minuti, è molto semplice, vi serve una maglietta bianca, una marker pen e um, seguitemi. Fate le vostre magliette e postatele sui vostri social media. Così insieme possiamo supportare Vets for Ukraine 2022. So, liebe Freunde, Kolleginnen und Kollegen, das ist das T-Shirt, das Sie gerade gemacht haben. Folgen Sie mir, posten Sie Ihre T-Shirt in Ihren sozialen Medien und gemeinsam unterstützen wir Vets for Ukraine 2022. So, many thanks for your attention and bye bye. Grazie a tutti per la vostra attenzione e ci vediamo presto. Vielen Dank für Ihre Zeit und auf Wiedersehen. So, let's do your T-shirt and post it on your social media. Like our colleague, one of our colleagues has done um, uh, exactly so following our example. He has created his own T-shirt and um, uh, he is a, an orthopedic surgeon and he will uh, organize uh, like CPDs for in, orthop in orthopedics and he will uh, donate uh, the money um, that he gains from the CPD to um, USAVA. So now, um, without any further delay, we um, 
actually, I wanted to say, if for some reason I uh, you don't see me anymore tonight, is because I'm on call and um, I might have to go back to work. So in case I will have to leave uh, Professor Rob Fall on his own with his talk. I hope not, but just to warn you. Um, and before to give the words to to Professor Rob Fall, um, Paolo, can you share please the sharing uh, countdown because. Remember, it's very important to share this link, this webinar, this slide to everyone. Paolo, please. So here we are. So, Professor Rob Fall, welcome, hey, <laughs> welcome Rob, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for supporting us with with one of your um, lectures on diabetes in cats. Just wanted to say, Rob, Rob has been my boss for <laughs> yes, <laughs> for nearly uh, three years. He was a great boss, and we we miss him a lot at work. Um, yes, uh, and now I don't want to uh, to 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 talk anymore. I just give the word to Rob, and please enjoy his lecture. And if you like it, uh, if you don't like it, basically just donate. <laughs> <laughs> donate. <laughs> donate to make me go quiet. Hey, don't you don't will certainly like it. Uh, for <laughs> all the people that are interested in internal medicine, this will be a very very interesting. Um, uh, CPD and but don't forget to donate and don't forget to share. See you later. Rob, thank you. Thanks yeah. for the introduction. Really grateful. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, good evening from Cambridge, uh, where I'm sitting. I'd like to say thank you very much, Steve, for that very generous introduction, Jamie, and also to Jane. Thank you very much, Steve, for your introduction. Um, I'm slightly worried the bar's been set very high. I have expectations, so I'll do my very best to um, uh, to mean that uh, you can uh, understand um, uh, you gain something out of it, and that we get uh, a good evening here. So, um, without further ado, I will um, thank you. And this is, uh, I, I'm sure you're like me. Um, I, I have several of a number of patients in my career that have really made a big difference to uh, why I do things the way I do, or even why I am now an internist. And um, I can really clearly remember the first two diabetic patients I ever managed in practice. Um, one of them was a West Island White Terrier uh, called Bobby, who had uh, diabetes. And um, uh, Bobby was able to manage Bobby fairly well, I think, for a one year out graduated vet. Uh, we got him fairly stable and he did pretty well. And then my second diabetic patient, there was a cat. And it was an 11 year old neutered male domestic short haired cat called Smudge. And um, Smudge stretched my ability, I think it's fair to say, as a, as a young uh, vet in general practice, um, because he was overweight, he was a lovely, lovely cat. He was one of those classic examples of a lovely cat, really lovely owners, real difficult to get a good outcome. And um, we didn't know a lot of what I'm gonna talk about back in 1997. So I was just trying to treat Smudge with um, insulin lente, boban lente as it was, and we got him okay, but maybe not quite as uh, stable as I wanted. And 18 months after I, I saw him, we um, I was lived for 18 months, I left the practice and moved to a, a new job. And um, I gather he was not too bad, but he's one of those patients that stuck in my mind that I wanted to do better. And uh, I think at this point, I'd already, already realized I wasn't gonna be an orthopedic surgeon or probably any form of surgeon whatsoever. Um, so these are two patients that stuck in my mind and probably were formative in, uh, two of the things were formative in my decision to become an internist. So uh, there's a, a personal background, and I hope now what I can say, if I went back to the me of 25 years ago, I would manage smudge very differently and hopefully much more successfully than I, would, I did at the time. So, um, so really, the title of the talk is Why Cats Are Not Small Dogs. And I think the reason I've chose that title is because I think many of us are used and seem quite comfortable managing canine diabetes. And, it's a relatively common problem in, in uh, small animal medicine. Um, how many patients are there present in any country at any one time is difficult, but there's quite a few papers. 
a brilliant paper I've just quoted, if you haven't seen it at the bottom there, by my colleagues and good friends at the RBC, Lisa Davidson and Brian Catchpole with Yelena Ristic and Linda Freeman. And um, they said sort of certainly in the, in the UK, there's an instance of about 0.3% now or thereabouts uh, back in 2003 to 2005. Um, and certainly since that time, uh, we now think that the instance is probably rising. And in the UK currently, um, uh, there's around about 12 and a half million dogs in the UK, which means there's a lot of diabetic patients um, at any one time. So I think we're all fairly happy that we can check sets of insulin, uh, maybe put them on a high fiber diet and inject them. And, and if you want to get them stable, then these dog patients will generally do fairly well. And the reason they're, in theory, a slightly easier to manage than cats is that the majority of diabetic dogs have primary insulin deficiency as the underlying cause of their diabetes. So um, the cause of insulin uh, deficiency, the beach islets are no longer making insulin. Um, the causes of that are variable. Um, and it's, although it's very similar to type one human diabetes, it's not exactly the same because the majority of type one diabetic humans become diabetic as teenagers or adults in their early twenties. And the vast majority of our diabetic patients in dogs become diabetic when they're sort of seven, eight, nine years of age. So probably more similar to the late onset diabetes of the adult in humans and diabetic dogs, but it's still nevertheless a type one based disease in the vast majority of our dogs. There are one or two exceptions I've written down here, obviously um, female entire dogs are post season, dogs with Cushing's, um, or patients you may be given progestogens to for some reason. But the vast majority of our canine patients have an insulin deficiency, therefore analogous to a human type one. Now, feline diabetes, which is also the aim of the talk this evening, that is actually also, I think, much more common than many colleagues, and certainly most of the general public, but I think also a large number of veterinary colleagues actually think. And depending on which paper you read, uh, the, the first sort of data, really decent data coming out on feline diabetes was from Australia, the Jackie Rand's group. And certainly in her papers, um, depending on the breed of cat, up to one in, in Burmese cats, one in 50 uh, Burmese cats in Australia have been uh, published to be uh, developed diabetes up to one in 400 depending on which paper and there's a brilliant uh, study came out from uh, the RBC um, in uh, about five six years ago and they looked at just under a quarter of a million cats in the UK they reported that one in 200 of those cats um, developed diabetes so this is I think more common than many people think and that's why I think it's an area where we should be focusing on improving our treatment and hopefully by the end of this, this hour um, you'll be confident to do the same. Now, in human diabetes, um, uh, there's we come on to major difference in, in cats is, is that they're not much like type one. And there's some indications like that that we know that there are certain breeds of cat that certainly seem much more prone to developing diabetes than others. Um, in Australia, in the UK, the Burmese is the, is the, is the uh, cat that's instantly uh, quoted. Actually, Australia, it was an odd ratio of them being four times more likely than the domestic short hair. In the UK, they're publishing three times more likely to develop diabetes. And we don't see as many Norwegian forest cats or, or Tonkinese, but they certainly also seem very prone to developing the disease compared to an average. What was interesting is that Persians uh, seem to have a lower than average risk. Um, and so this is in some ways similar to the dog, where we have um, certain breeds of dog, a Samoyed and the small breed terriers that seem to get diabetes at a much higher rate than others. Um, and actually, diabetes in dogs is a disease that boxer dogs do not get. You know, that's something you didn't think I'd say, that boxers don't get a disease. But boxer dogs uh, seem to have a very low incidence of diabetes, um, possibly due to having large islets. It's an interesting area. But in cats, we don't yet know, to my knowledge, that, that why Persians seem to probably be a lower average risk, but they do indeed seem to have that. So there's instantly we're thinking, hmm, maybe there's a genetic predilection or something going on here. And also, a bit like in, in dogs, uh, we see an increased instance with increasing age. So there's some similarities here with dogs, but the biggest difference is that the underlying pathogenesis in cats is very different to that that we find in the dog. And what we now know is that almost every, um, probably at least 95% of cats, at the beginning of their diabetic journey um, are actually analogous to type two diabetes in humans, not type one. So what I mean by that is that in type two diabetes, initially the beach islets are still producing insulin, but that insulin is not working as well as it should. And there's progressively worsening function of that insulin 
in the patient's body. Why doesn't the insulin work? Well, it's normally because there's some form of peripheral antagonism, resistance, or reduced sensitivity to the function of the insulin, so it just doesn't work well enough. And that then slowly leads to a situation, or gradually to a situation where you have hyperglycemia, which becomes uncontrolled, but then the hyperglycemia itself worsens the problem even further. And I'll come on to explain why that is, but it's linked to a condition that we sort of loosely would term glucose toxicity, where um, worse, more, the, the worse the hyperglycemia is, the worse the problem becomes. So the key difference between dogs and cats is that dogs have an insulin deficiency diabetes and cats have an insulin resistance diabetes. And systemic insulin resistance is the most important underlying cause in the diabetic cats. So what could cause uh, that sort of insulin resistance in our patients? And there's probably, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put three here, um, there's many, but the first one is definitely obesity. We'll come to talk about that in more detail. Um, we'll talk about the genetics in a little bit or something, maybe there's a genetic cause. And we'll also talk a little bit about acromegaly. And I think the key uh, sort of feature here is that if you look at type two diabetes in humans, we know that there's quite a number of contributing factors. And, um, insulin resistance, a result of excessive calorie intake and reduced activity is certainly something that's very well documented in, uh, in human patients. And we'll come to talk about this, but that is what we think is definitely happening in many of our feline patients. Um, secondly, that type 2 diabetes, though, can also be seen as an inherited trait in certain populations. So type 2 diabetes is much more common, for example, in Pacific Islanders, um, Native American Indians, and Australian Aborigines. Um, uh, and I've already alluded to that there are certain breeds of cat that seem to get it, uh, diabetes mellitus, more commonly than others. So supportive that um, diabetic cats are analogous to, to type 2 humans. Third feature of human type 2 diabetes is that beach island beta islet function gradually deteriorates in the face of the hyperglycemia. And um, it loses the inability to compensate for the increased demand of insulin. I'll come to talk, that is definitely something that happens in, in our feline diabetics. Um, and the last thing is that you can have reduced insulin sensitivity and, and allegedly insulin resistance without there being obesity. And that is also the case in cats. So, I think that the conclusion human medicine is that type 2 diabetes is definitely a multifactorial disease. And I think, I hope by the end of tonight, you'll agree with me that type 2 diabetes, sorry, diabetes medicine, the cat, is also a multifactorial condition. But the key features are very similar to that in type 2 diabetes in the human. So I, I said that uh, the, the increase in glucose causes a problem. And I'm just trying to show this uh, diagrammatically. So um, in the top right of this page here, you can see the insulin resistance. I'm using that as a catch-all term for reduced insulin sensitivity, um, uh, genetic factors, but the insulin that the, the cat is producing does not work as well as it used to. So what we have is um, you then get hyperglycemia and that then the response to the hyperglycemia of the beta islets is to make more insulin. So there's an increased demand, but that actually damages the islets. And there's, um, you can get some oxidative damage, but whenever we produce insulin, we also produce uh, amylin as a, as, um, within the insulin. And amylin, if it uh, uh, is present in the beta islets in excessive amounts, will actually um, beta pleat itself and form amyloid. So the, the more insulin you make, you actually can start to get amyloid deposition within your islets. So you're getting physical damage to the islets. And that can obviously lead to their further reduction of insulin production. So if you come across the left-hand side on this diagram, as a result of the beta islet damage, we get a worsening failure to glycemic control, which can lead to uncontrolled hyperglycemia. And very high levels of glucose actually also directly damage the beta islets. So uh, hyperglycemia, the beta islets are trying to work their very hardest, they use an English phrase they use, working their socks off, um, but that actually leads to their demise because we get more and more damage, more and more oxidative damage, more and more amyloid deposition, and that leads to further worsening and gradual deterioration of glycemic status. So, and this is um, different to the dog, where we have a failure of beta islet function, so on the bottom right, failure of glycemic control and uncontrolled hyperglycemia, but that's it. Um, and then the only problem is that the risk of going on to become ketotic. Cats can certainly also become ketotic, but they don't fall into the cycle of decline, where the beta islets, if we can break this cycle, 
it's highly likely, not always, but it is likely that white charts will be able to restore their function, um, which is why feline diabetes is so fascinating that there is actually a chance that we can actually cause a remission and stop having to inject insulin if we get the treatment right. That's the holy grail that we're all reaching for. Um, so the beta islets, however, if the beta islets are damaged to the point of being irretrievable, then the patient will become permanently diabetic. Um, but there will almost certainly still be the insulin resistance as the underlying cause. So what could cause this insulin resistance? Well, the first thing we know is that um, in human uh, medicine, obesity is a very well-established cause. Um, and there's a markedly increased instance of, of uh, diabetes and type 2 diabetes in people who are overweight. And uh, does that happen in cats? Well, the answer is absolutely does. Um, so we're in my study. Oh, God, it was in my reading list for my residency, so I think it's fairly recent, but actually it's over 20 years ago now. Um, again, from uh, Jackie Ranch group, where they took a group of cats and they uh, fed them free access to uh, energy dense, highly palatable food for around 10 months. So just let them have free access. And on average, these cats gained 1.9 kilos, which is on average, I'll say, a 44% uh, weight gain compared to the start of the study. Um, in, that, in those cats, what I showed was that there was a um, more than 50% uh, reduction in insulin sensitivity. So these patients, just purely by putting on weight, were starting to show evidence of resistance to, the, to their insulin. Um, so uh, why does so? Uh, and so it's really clear that having carrying too much weight over cats makes you prone to become diabetic. Why does it do this? Well, as um, soon as we have um, obesity, we have altered adipokine hormones and altered lipid metabolism. So there's a whole metabolic sequelae um, to this. Um, now, having said that, though, what's really interesting is not all obese cats become diabetic and not all diabetic cats are obese. So the story is definitely more complicated than that, as we think the case is in people. And I've already alluded to the fact that genetics uh, are underlying very key part of type 2 diabetes and in preparing for this and a, and a previous lecture I was looking to how many candidate genes we looked at in human medicine and I, I lost count to over 75. I'm sure there's probably way more that have been analyzed. Um, and the fact that we have certain cats that have seen breeds that seem predisposed would suggest there's a genetic component to feline diabetes as well. Now to my knowledge there's only been one study to look at potential causal gene, which was uh, Yaita Forkara and uh, Steve Neeson, the team at the, the RBC. Um, and uh, if I well, have just a little plug that uh, I warmly recommend uh, Steen's uh, webinar to you on Wednesday evening. Um, he's a fantastic speaker and an awesome clinician. Um, so I'm sure we'll have a, a fascinating evening listening to Steen on, on Wednesday at, uh, regarding cushions. Um, but what uh, this paper in, um, showed was that they were looking for I think called a melanocortin 4 or MCR4 receptor. Now, MCR4 is in human medicine, um, there's been mutations in this, it's been the most uh, common single gene mutation associated with obesity in human medicine. So, what is MCR4? Well, MCR4 is, is a, a gene called coding for receptor in the hypothalamus, and it's very important in our control of um, appetite and, and satiety, feeling satisfied and full after eating. And in the normal state, um, MCR, when we have a positive energy balance and we've, we've eaten, MCR4 is stimulated by alpha MSH. And that stimulation makes us feel full. It creates satiety and switches our appetite off. But as we um, enter a negative energy balance, and in particular as leptin levels fall um, as a result of, of, of um, needing food, um, the uh, MCR4 uh, is actually antagonized by a thing called a guti related protein, AGRP. And that um, binding of AGRP to MCR4 actually makes us feel hungry. So uh, the postulation in human medicine is that the mutations in MCR4 may mean that uh, the alpha MSH cannot um, bind, and therefore you don't feel full and have satiety from your appetite, and therefore you have an excessive appetite as a result of mutation in MCR4. So um, for Carter, uh group looked at this in cats and they looked using um, a single nucleotide polymorphism analysis or step chip analysis, um, sector uh, of the feline genome. And 
brilliantly, they found that there were actually three um, polymorphisms in, in affecting the MCR4 gene, two of which probably were structural, one of which was analogous to a change that uh, you find in the human um, uh, polymorphism. And it was really interesting that this polymorphism was identified in 55% of the overweight diabetic studied. Um, so it's not, not the only answer, but it's very supportive of the idea that this may be one of the reasons why these particular cats were becoming overweight, was that MTR4 is not working, and therefore you can't switch the hunger off. Um, what's also interesting though, that some of these cats were lean that had the polymorphism, I think it's 33% 30, 30, uh, of them were lean. So it also raised the possibility of, will these cats go on to be diabetic? So the possibility of will MTR4 analysis possibly be a future test that we may be utilize to predict whether a cat has had an increased risk of becoming diabetic or not. I'm not sure if that actually has been done yet. Um, Steen, if you let me know on Wednesday, I'm going to speak, that'd be lovely. But, uh, so again, it's, it's not the only answer, but we definitely need uh, to understand the genetics of our feline diabetics more. Um, I'm sure there'll be more comparisons of the human type 2 diabetics um, than we understand those at the present time. So we've got obesity and we have some genetic influences on appetite that make cats overweight. Um, uh, a, a paper that actually changed the way I, I work was um, published by Steen um, uh, six, seven years ago now, where um, I think we're all used to acromegaly or hypersomatotropism, where um, think of it in, in maybe entire female dogs who um, can be develop acromegaly after repeated seasons. But acromegaly, certainly when I was at Cambridge, I, I said I'd never seen a, a, a macromegaly cat in my first four or five years of practice, but I saw uh, seven acromegalic cats while I was at Cambridge because my residency, because we treated them with um, uh, radiotherapy. So and I was fascinated by this disease. And we were thought at that time it really wasn't very common. But one of the problems that acromegaly where you have an excess of growth hormone is a growth hormone is an antagonist to insulin. So uh, it causes marked peripheral resistance and therefore can be a trigger to make a feline patient become diabetic. Um, and we had some lovely patients uh, um, in, at Cambridge, which uh, Mark Dunning eventually published in, in JSAP um, a few years ago, where we proved they were diabetic, um, found a pituitary mass, which is it's the pituitary, a uh, benign pituitary tumour causing the excessive growth hormone in cats that is the underlying cause of acromegaly. And uh, we would treat these with external beam radiation, and a hypo fractionated cause. And the, we actually, Mark published some great data out of Cambridge showing really good resolution. Um, a marked reduction in the insulin resistance in many patients with diabetic remission. But uh, what the RVC group published was actually they just screened um, uh, over a thousand cats with acromegaly. You screen acromegaly using measuring, you can't measure growth hormone because it's very labile, but you can measure insulin like growth factor or IGF1, which is uh, formed by the liver in response to growth hormone. And uh, what the, the group study found, I think to everyone's surprise, was that over just over a quarter of these um, uh, cats screened actually have a positive um, for high levels of IGF-1, anything over a thousand as a, um, uh, units would be diagnostic of acromegaly. And when they then took a subset of these cats, they found that the very, very large reward did indeed have a causal pituitary mass. So the, I think it certainly took me by surprise that this paper decided that the overall prevalence of acromegaly in diabetic cats was actually around about a quarter. So, and what was, again, the, I think that's a bit of an eye was that um, around about a quarter of these patients did not in, present with classic signs of acromegaly. Um, I'll come on to explain what the classic signs of acromegaly are. There's some pictures for you in about 15 minutes' time. But these cats looked fairly normal to the attending clinicians. So I've now, um, firstly, I would now actually do a screen for acromegaly in any newly diagnosed diabetic cat even if it looks like a completely normal shape and size. Um, so and that's with a simple um, spun down serum um, submitted to uh, an external lab to measure IGF-1. So uh, something I hope that is a useful knowledge for you. So as I said, so as a summary, um, the, the underlying di di pathogenesis of diabetes in a cat is that we develop in insulin resistance can develop for a variety of different reasons. And then you get um, a combination of amyloidosis, but also glucose and lipid toxicity within the beach islets. And um, 
that, if it's allowed to go unchecked, will eventually lead to permanent vitriolic damage and the patient being permanently diabetic. But if we can remove some of this toxicity by getting the glycemic status back under control, which is why we do still treat cats with um, diabetic prevention, then this is often reversible. And just uh, the, the little pictures here, I'm definitely not a histopathologist, so if there are any histopathologists listening, I, I apologize, but don't describe this very well. Um, the, the picture at the top right there is, is a picture of a beta islet in the middle. Um, and beta islets are utterly fascinating. And I know my children will now tell me I say that I need to get out more, but I, they are just incredibly amazing bits of kit. Um, but we still don't completely understand how they function. Um, but and if you look at the slide at the bottom, what you see that is a, a also a beach islet, slightly deep magnification, which I apologise. But you can see some areas of just um, purple uh, sort of schmoo, if I want a better word, but just an amorphous material, and that is amyloid, um, uh, sort of squashing and crushing and damaging the the um, functional cells within that islet. And if that amyloid deposition continues, um, as a result of excessive insulin secretion from that from the islet, then that islet is going to be permanently damaged and will become permanently non-functional. So it's a race against time when we're managing feeling diabetes to see if we can prevent permanent damage and reverse this pathology. So um, actually, before I say that, I'll, I'll just say one more thing before we go to the side. The other thing about cats, obviously, is it, it's just an analogy to human medicine. Well, why we why we we change the way cats live. I think it's the other thing I should have said earlier. Sorry, is that if you look at human um, beings, we've um, changed the way we live, particularly in the last 150 years with the Industrial Revolution, certainly in the Western world, where we've gone from being a, um, uh, not so much a hunter gatherer society, but certainly one where we had to work for our food in small little um, uh, sort of communities, um, a very much a hand to mouth existence um, with large amounts of physical activity. And urbanization and the avail free availability or the ease of, ease availability of food um, in large areas of the world is leading to obesity. But actually, there's some mirrors of that with the feline population where um, cats are obligate carnivores, they are very much hunter gatherers. Um, and in the last, we, we've improved so many things in cat welfare and our management. But um, many cats now are urban cats, not countryside cats. Many cats are indoor cats. Um, they have um, free access to high calorie containing food. So there are some parallels even in the um, environmental factors um, that lead to potentially to that development of diabetes in the cat. So that is why cats are different to dogs, and that is the underlying pathology, and I hope that makes sense. Now, once, however, you've become diabetic, the, the pathophysiology of the cat, dog, or human is actually very similar, that the absence of functional insulin or the inability of insulin to work means that the tissues cannot utilize glucose um, and so we get increased gluconeogenesis we get glycogen um, tissue catabolism um, production of ketones and, and, and movement away from a carbohydrate based metabolism and so we have large amounts of glucose in the circulation um, and which is freely filtered at glomerulus but um, the proximal tubules although they're very good at reabsorbing glucose they have a limit um, that limit is around about uh, the equivalent of 10 millimoles per litre in the blood. So as soon as we get more than 10 millimoles, right there or thereabouts, then uh, the, the tubules can no longer re re reabsorb um, that glucose, so it is just lost through the renal tubules. But that obviously has an osmotic diuretic effect. So we have a primary osmotic diuresis um, uh, to generate polyuria, and then a secondary compensatory polydipsia. Um, so one of the cardinal signs of diabetes, obviously, is polyuria and polydipsia. Second cardinal sign is polyphagia. And the problem with this is that because you have reduced peripheral utilization of glucose, the best way to think of this is that all the cells in the periphery are starving. So um, the met metabolism, cytokines and a lot of other sort of cell signaling indicates we need to increase appetite. So uh, these patients will be polyphagic, polydipsic, polyuric, but they will be losing weight. And those are the, the cardinal signs of, of, of diabetes, and they're exactly the same in a cat than they are in a dog. Obviously, if the cat's an indoor outdoor cat, um, the owner may not be aware of how much a cat is drinking. Um, I think one of those key bits of history that you and I need to take in the consultant room is um, are you seeing your cat drink? Um, because I think many of us don't know that cats even 
be able to consume water at any point in their lives. But if an owner suddenly says, well, I'm noticing an increase in drinking, or I'm actually even noting my cat drinking, I didn't a few weeks ago, that almost certainly covers my drinking water. One of the features of uh, canine diabetes and human diabetes is the development of cataracts. And I think um, many of us uh, are under the impression that cats do not develop cataracts, and, and, and that is not true. Um, uh, Renata, uh, who speak on uh, it next Friday, uh, would be much better place to answer how the cataracts form and, and, and what form they take than I am. But uh, cats do develop diabetic cataracts, they just tend not to hypermature. Um, so, but they definitely will have that. There's also now, um, again, we know that diabetic, um, diabetes in, in humans causes marked vascular disease. In fact, being diabetic is the number one cause of the kidney transplant because of vascular disease and causing kidney damage in the UK. And, and I think until recently, we, we didn't really think that our diabetic patients experience much in the way of long-term vascular disease complications. But um, clear evidence now, published evidence, that if you are a feline and you are diabetic, that you are much more likely to develop chronic renal failure in the same way as humans. Um, so, and I'm sure over time we will now develop other knowledge of other vascular disease uh, issues with in our diabetic cats and dogs. And also I think um, diabetic cats, we, we tend not to think of cats developing keep the risk of being as rough risk of ketosis as um, dogs. Um, but I can very, very well remember my first feline uh, diabetic patient, which one I've been, uh, just started at uh, Dick White Referrals, and I've been with Dick for about six months, and uh, I've bought a cat that was typically owned by, guess what, a consultant in diabetes at our local general hospital, which is uh, one of the world's leading um, human hospitals. So no pressure. Uh, we did manage to get the cat completely back to normal. Um, but uh, at that point, I realized that ketosis does occur in our cats as well. And we need to, it's just as serious and we need to treat it according to how we treat it in, in them. So we're clinicians. How, that's how diabetes is caused, why it's there, um, what we think the underlying pattern physiology is and, and the problems it can cause. How are you and I going to diagnose this disease? Well, there are some fairly common patterns in, in feline diabetes. And first to say is it is, it is much more common in middle-aged to older cats. Um, and in a couple of papers, the peak age of an instance is between the age of 10 to 12. So similar in some ways to uh, hypothyroidism, I suppose. Um, but these and hypothyroid cats can be PUP, PU, PD and polyphagic. Um, so it's one of your differential diagnoses um, that uh, we need to rule in and rule out in our, in our workup. Um, depending on the paper, there is certainly a suspicion that uh, male cats seem overrepresented in the females in most studies, although there's one or two studies that doubt that now. So uh, whether there's a specific male susceptibility, um, is the jury's doubt. I, I personally think it probably there is a male susceptibility, but what's causing that, we don't know. And how these patients present? Like I said, they're going to have the cardinal signs. They will have polyuria, they will probably polydipsic, or at least if the owner knows or recognizes their drinking. Um, there will be polyphagia and weight loss. And this may be one of the differentiators between a patient with hypothyroidism. Not all hypothyroid cats are crazy, I know. Um, but most diabetic cats, if anything, will be lethargic um, because they're moving away from carbohydrate based metabolism. And they may or may not be ketotic. So they're certain, it's quite like to be more sleepy um, or maybe changing behavior, being indoors more or hiding. Um, uh, those are the key things we're going to hear in our history. Um, now I need to thank, thank uh, John Ray and, and, and through John, uh, Dr. Andy Sparks for, for this photograph. Um, I think I was certainly taught, my memory at vet school is that uh, diabetic cats develop a plantar grade stance. And this is a diabetic cat, you can see um, with a, he's a little underweight, poor chap with a stereo hair coat, and obviously a weight loss over, over his hind legs with a classic plantar grade stance. And, and this cat was indeed diabetic. However, the more and more diabetic cats I see, I, I think that plantar grade stance is something I don't see very often. So if you have a cat with plantar grade stance and it's losing weight, I'm very suspicious that it, amongst many uh, several neurological differentials, diabetes mellitus is definitely on a differential list. But if I have a cat without a plantar grade stance, it can definitely still be diabetic. So what are we going to find on clinical signs? Well, we're going to see a patient um, who will have weight loss, almost certainly. Um, they could be in a relatively poor body condition. 
Um, you may have evidence of, of the plantable stance. You may see mild cataract formation, often just looking like the little Mercedes Benz sign if you're doing a, a, a examination of the lens. But there shouldn't be any other major obvious abnormalities on physical examination. There is no reason to believe this patient should be particularly anemic. They might be slightly tachycardic, but again, uh, depending, and if they're ketotic, they may well be. Um, they're unlikely to be tachypneic, although ketotic patients can sometimes be tachypneic. For abdominal palpation, temperature, pulse, respiration, otherwise should be really fairly normal. So, to help us make a diagnosis, we need to get some uh, some diagnostic material. And um, obviously, it, it, if you can find a persistent resting hyperglycemia or glucosuria, um, then that is uh, going to be very, very suggestive, if not diagnostic of diabetes. So, but certainly running a serum biochemistry and the hematology are things we're going to need to be doing. Firstly, to identify the hyperglycemia, and secondly, to see if we can rule out any comorbidities. However, one of the problems with cats is they are phenomenally brilliant pets, but they're not always the most cooperative patient. And cats physiologically are, are fascinating because they um, cats develop this stress hyperglycemia really very quickly. So just the presence of being popped in a basket and come to your surgery or my surgery, uh, let alone you and I sticking a needle um, in this cat's jugular, is going to be enough to cause these poor little cats to be stressed. And many cats will have a transient hyperglycemia in response to stress. Um, and this is not something you're going to see with a dog. So um, if you have a, diabetic, a cat and you have hyperglycemia on your biochemistry analysis, um, do not instantly condemn it as being a diabetic. You need to see if it's persistent, is there any history consistent with it, any physical examination consistent with it, or see if we can find some other supportive evidence. So a stress hyperglycemia is unlikely to lead to a marked glucosuria. Um, if you have marked glucosuria, that would suggest this patient must have been um, hyperglycemic for at least 15 minutes, if not half an hour or more. Um, and if it's repeatable, um, certainly if you can get a urine sample at home, in a, in a not using non absorbent litter and there's glucose in that, then that is not highly, highly unlikely to be linked to stress. The other thing we could do that I, I do reach for um, on a regular basis is to use fructosamine. Um, fructosamine, I think, is, is useful or can be useful in the diagnosis of diabetes in both cats and dogs. Um, as I'm sure you remember, fructosamine is the non enzymatic binding of glucose to albumin. So it's a purely mass action event. And on the basis that albumin levels don't change that much, if uh, on a, certainly on a short term basis, that if, um, if, fructo, if high glucose levels will lead to increased binding and therefore increased levels of fructosamine. And the half life of fructosamine is the same as albumin, which average cat is going to be between about 14 to 18 days. So if a cat is hyperglycemic persistently for several days, fructosamine will start to rise. So, and certainly anything over 400, and it depends on your lab actually, what the reference range, um, uh, do what fills we're using around 350 as a normal, but anything over 400 would be very suggestive that this patient has been hyperglycemic for a period of time before it saw you. And I think that therefore is extremely useful. There's one or two things to remember with fructosamine though, and, and it goes back to my comment on hyperthyroidism, that um, the half-life of fructosamine is dependent on albumin. And if you have a hypermetabolic state, as it can exist in um, hyperthyroidism, where the half life of oven may be somewhat shorter than normal, you can have a falsely lowered fructosamine compared to what it would be if the half life of oven had been normal. So, um, part of the workup is going to be to rule out other possible comorbidities or a disease that could look like diabetes and hyperthyroidism. You need to run a basal T4, a resting T4 in all these patients. I already said I would also just want them there, run an IGF-1 to, if I thought cat was diabetic. So for me, I wanted to, running a biochemistry, looking for resting hyperglycemia, um, and may see some elevations in alkaline phosphatase uh, related to that, change in ALT, may see some change in cholesterol, in order to see if the patient's ketotic, which can be done on blood or on urine, obviously. But I'm now also looking to see if there's any other comorbidities. So can I rule in or rule out kidney disease, urea cracking, yes, DNA. Um, and your specific gravity. Your complete blood count, your hematology, will probably be fairly unremarkable depending on how well or unwell the cat presents to you. But I wouldn't expect the plate of the cat to be abnormal. I wouldn't necessarily expect the cat to be anemic. 
Um, there may be a stress leukogram uh, with a neutrophilia and or lymphopenia, um, for example, depending on how unwell they are. But your hypothesis with these bloods should be that the hematology is relatively normal. Um, now, what about glycosylated hemoglobin? That's obviously uh, one of the diagnostic bedside or bedside tests of choice in human medicine, where, again, you glycosylated hemoglobin is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a non-enzymatic binding of glucose to hemoglobin. And therefore, because hemoglobin is a much longer half-life, um, you know, 60 days in a cat and 90 days in a dog, that's a really good marker of your average glycemic status over the previous cats, a couple of months. So glycosylated hemoglobin you can use, but it's not as easily available um, as a diagnostic test, whether that's not available in every country. So for me, I would use fructosamine um, um, along with biochem uh, hematology and the urinalysis um, to see um, whether there's evidence of glucose as well. If we have all those things, then we've made a diagnosis of the cat being diabetic. Now, again, depending on one of the key things to remember, um, depending on, on which study you published, I think the best take home is to estimate that around about 50% of all diabetic patients, either cat or dog, will have an active urinary tract infection on presentation. So, um, certain, and if you have, if that was to develop into a pyelonephritis, that will, guess what, cause more insulin resistance. So, identifying uh, the presence of urinary tract infection is crucial. Um, so, we do want to get a, a cysto from these cats. Um, and running a full year analysis, doing a cultural sensitivity as well, and a sediment examination. Uh, one little thing to say on your analysis while I'm here, though, is that um, glucose dissolved in urine um, will alter the uh, refractive, re refractive index. So diabetic cats look like they have hyperstemiuric urine. So I'll have a spitter gravity 10, 30, 10, 40. But I've said to you, these patients are polydipsic and polyuric. And actually, if you um, to measure the urine osmolarity, you'll find that that is um, there is dilute urine there. It's just that it's difficult to prove that if you're in a, using a refractometer. Now, I mentioned acromegaly um, as, as something that we need to test for as well. And I, I, I now do would do this as part of once I've confirmed a cat is diabetic, um, I'm going to try to rule in or rule out hypothyroidism, and I'm going to want to rule in or rule out acromegaly. And it's uh, Interesting, actually, cats, because almost every cat that gets acromegaly is male. Um, it's unusual to have a female acromegaly cat. It's not impossible, but it's unusual. And it's caused by a functional tumour of the pituitary gland, um, and normally it's benign, and causes marked production of growth hormone, which then causes insulin-resistant diabetes. And certainly, the up until um, the paper from the RBC group, I think most I sit was under the impression that these cats, the best way to describe them is they're big and they look like unneutered toms, but they've been neutered. So um, a classic uh, acromegalic cat has increased soft tissue around the mouth, around the skin. Um, they can, they may have some joint swellings and lameness. Um, uh, they may present with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. Um, uh, so they can develop HCM, they can develop renal failure. And the patients I saw, um, certainly might the ones I've seen, probably sitting between, so, sort of six and a half to eight kilos um, as a domestic shorthead cat. So seven to eight probably more common. But we now know that they can be, can be completely normal. So um, if you've got any doubt at all, I would measure IGF-1. So one of physical examination, this is a, just a it, it difficult, I never get a perfect little cat, but this is obviously a normal uh, normal cat uh, with normal dental spacing. Um, if you've got an acromegalic patient, if you look at the patient on the on the left here, it happens to be a ginger, Tom, um, there's increased spacing in between the incisors. Um, and what I can't see, but if you take a view from the uh, lateral, that's from the side aspect, there's actually a gap between the upper and the lower canine, which does not exist um, in a normal cat. And this chap on the left here was one of my patients at Cambridge, he is acromegalic. And this little cat on the right here, you can see, although he's lost, he's lost some of his incisors, he's marked uh, soft tissue and gingival swelling, gum swelling, um, and he was also acromegalic. And that was one of, one of his presenting signs. Um, and these are three of my favorite patients um, uh, from my time in my residency at Cambridge. I loved being at Cambridge, a fantastic residency program. And um, uh, these cats, I think the smallest one was the little chap in the middle, um, who was uh, 7.2 kilos. And a uh, nice little story here, he actually did really, really well with his treatment. And, and I was, uh, we, we diagnosed him as pituitary mass and uh, um, with uh, 
Dr. Dan Dobson, we gave him uh, hypofractionated radiotherapy, had 10 courses over a period of, uh, 10 fractions over the period of, of, of three weeks. And about a, a month later, I got um, a letter from there and opened it, and it started with those dreaded lines, Dear Mr. Fall, I'm writing to make a formal complaint. And I thought, oh, goodness me, what on earth have I done wrong here? And I read down the letter and it was lovely. It was actually a joke. Um, and what had happened with him is with the radiotherapy, we used a three beam entry. I don't have pictures to show him, afraid, but a little one centimeter um, square field of radiation. And where he was, it was, they go just below the ears and on the top of his head. And where the radiation had gone, he'd actually developed white hair. So he had three white squares on his head. Um, and the lady was making a joke to say that she was complaining with sport his appearance. Um, but actually, she was delighted because he actually went on in a complete diabetic remission and stayed free of insulin um, until I lost contact with him about three years later. So these are lovely cats um, uh, that uh, certainly been key in my career. So if you do have a patient with diabetes and you do a screen for IGF-1, um, anything over a thousand with a diagnostic of um, acromegaly, and uh, then to confirm whether or not they have a functional mass is going to be the CT or an MR. Um, so uh, it, obviously that may or may not need referral depending on the facilities that, that you have in, in local to you. How do you treat acromegalyx? Um, <clears throat> uh, well, certainly, um, depending on where you are in, in the world, um, external beam radiation would actually be probably what I would um, still go for. Um, we have um, uh, now certainly with hyperfractionation uh, becoming more available in the UK and certainly to become any more available as time goes on. Um, and certainly other centers now in Europe developing hyperfractionation that is much more efficacious and safe than hypofractionation. I think it, it would, we just wait for some decent studies to come out, but I think that would be the way to go. Um, surgical hypophysectomy is certainly um, for the church masses. It's routine in uh, for, let's say, a Cushmoy dog in, in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, and the RBC team. And so it's that's certainly been shown to be safe and effective, but you need to be a really experienced surgeon. And um, it's not one that's definitely a referral surgery. And there's also been a, a, a recent study um, by a colleague in the UK showing that um, the somatostatin analog, um, uh, Passeratide, is, that is, can reduce IGF 1 levels and help reduce improve insulin sensitivity. So that may be a, a medical option if, if either of the two. Two options up there. Uh, radiotherapy or surgical treatment are not possible where you are. But let's go back to what is a normal diabetic. So, what are we trying to do with diabetes treating the diabetic treatment? Well, patient, well, what we wanted to do is we're wanting to get the glycemic control to be as good as possible. But I think we ought to probably accept that the chance of us making it perfect in dogs is quite small. And what but in cats, the better we can make the treatment the more we will stop that vicious cycle of the glucose toxicity, the lipid toxicity, worsening amyloid deposition and worsening beta islet damage. So we really do need to, um, to please excuse the phrase, hit these cats quite hard with treatment. And the more we can, uh, attention we can give them, the more chance we have of, of reversing the complication. So um, I, I use the word aggressive treatment here. When we look about why we're doing these webinars with uh, a horrific war going on. I'm, I'm not sure that use that word is appropriate. So if anyone is offended by word aggressive, I apologise. But just to, if we can we're using it in the medical sense, the more we can do, there is a real chance of turning these patients around. However, I've already said cats and a brilliant pets aren't necessarily the best uh, patient, but it does require dedication on behalf of the owners to really uh, be on top of this and to work with us as the clinicians to get these patients right. But we are going to give these patients insulin. So cornerstone number one of treatment is exogenous insulin treatment. And what we're trying to do here is um, by the time the patients present to us, although they were producing insulin in the beginning, a lot of these patients will have got beta um, islet exhaustion or certainly very markedly suboptimal production of insulin. So by giving exogenous insulin, we're trying to overcome the insulin resistance, overcome the glucose toxicity, um, and give the islets time to rest time to recuperate and time to recover. Um, and there's uh, obviously, certainly UK, and I think like certainly in, in the rest of Europe, we have um, um, any, if there are anyone listening in the States, we have um, two main licensed products. Um, we've got can insulin, known as vet insulin in, in, in other countries, um, which is a porcine insulin, uh, an intermediate active porcine insulin, and prozinc, which is um, human insulin, um, uh, attached to zinc, so 
that's slightly longer than can insulin. Um, and the aim of these is both these products are designed to be given twice a day. Um, I'm going to say, I, I, certainly due to the problems of obtaining prozinc just before um, the COVID lockdowns, I've, I don't have uh, very much experience at all with prozinc, so I do have an awful lot of experience with, with can insulin. So I would still probably reach can insulin, but I'm, I'm intrigued by prozinc. Uh, it's potentially uh, reasons I would like to use it. So the recommended starting dose can insulin is 0.25 units per kilo. I have to say, I always start higher. My experience is I've never found that to work. So I'd normally start at 0.4, depending on the patient. Um, and uh, yeah, the can insulin dose, uh, sorry, the prosin direction dose is 0.4 units per kilo twice a day anyway. So um, we need to start that as soon as we can, and we need to be teaching the owner to inject. Uh, whether you use a VET pen like device or an insulin syringe, I think comes down to personal preference and the owner's preference. Um, there is a, there was a paper out last last year in JVIM suggesting that the use of vet pens is more accurate if you're trying to give two units or less, um, but with the recognition that vet pen-like devices probably almost always under deliver. Um, the key thing with vet pens is, as you're probably aware, if, if you're using them regularly, is you've got to give them time. Um, they, they do inject the insulin probably over a second or so. So when you Press the, the button, do not remove the uh, needle for a few seconds. Um, I'm old fashioned, I still like using, I recommend a, a, a sort of a 0.4 um, units per mil syringe with a fine 27 gauge needle, but come down to personal preference. The one thing I would say for um, colleagues, if there are any colleagues listening to this who also use human insulin, um, there is a difference in the concentration in these products. So both can insulin and uh, prozinc are at 40 units per mil. Whereas human insulin standard is 100 units per mil, so you need to use different syringes. Um, and if you model the syringes up, then you can certainly use a human, um, uh, sorry, can insulin syringe with a human insulin product, then you're going to overdose the patient. So um, I would start um, with uh, go back with, with this. I'm going to be starting at 0.4 units per kilo, and I would give that twice a day for probably five to seven days. Um, and we'll talk about glucose curves in a minute, but I would be doing that and then monitoring clinical signs. Um, I could do a glucose curve, that would be wonderful to prove it's working, but the, um, that would be my first approach. We'll talk about what diet we're going to give in a minute as well. If for some reason, though, um, can insulin is not available, prosinc is not available, or we've proven it's not worked for some reason, um, then one of the a phenomenally great product, which has just become very expensive in the UK, so I don't use it very much anymore, but certainly 10 years ago I was using it quite a bit, is a thing called insulin glargine. And insulin glargine is an insulin analog. It, 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 it's really clever. It forms a little crystalline products under the skin at, uh, at the pH, uh, at the physiological pH, that then release um, the insulin analog over time. And uh, again, a study out of Australia showed brilliant stabilization using, using glargine. Um, and I think glargine is very, very good. I think in experienced hands, whether it's better than protein or can insulin um, is possibly um, debatable, but glargine, if, if it's available to you um, and you don't have um, governing restrictions on its use, is, is a very, very good product. Again, starting at around a, a 0.3 to 0.4 units twice a day, it has to be given twice a day, I think, to, to me, it's that good. And the paper I just quoted there from Javin, they, 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 um, 13 cats uh, had the study, and this was uh, compared to Lente, so old bovine Lente. And um, the glargine group did at least as well. And uh, so the, certain studies supporting use of glargine you know, giving really high remission rates as well. But I think, um, I'm not sure that's necessarily a feature, personal opinion of the glargine, whether it's um, compared to so prosinc can insulin. Um, it's, that's, I think, still to be something to be elucidated. I think the key here is the timing of treatment relative to the development of diabetes is what is really, really important. The longer it takes to make the diagnosis, and the longer we, we take before we start treatment, the more damage there's going to be in those beta islets and the less chance of achieving a diabetic remission. Now, I think the holy grail for, well, the holy grail for any cat owner is to never have to inject your cat, I mean, <laughs> isn't it? Um, but I think that in a diabetic patient, I want to, or there are all treatments available with cats, although I, I don't use them anymore. So there was a really fascinating paper published last year in Javen. Um, uh, really great way. What they found, they basically was a once a week insulin injection. And what it is, it's feline insulin, uh, which is fused to the FC um, a portion of feline immunoglobulin. And that helps to protect the insulin from pageolysis. And uh, there was only five cats 
in the study, but they managed to show that in these five cats, they got a maintenance of successful control with just once a week injections. Um, and I, I don't know where the, where the study is going. I hope to goodness this is moving to, um, uh, to a larger scale study, but if we could have a once a week injection option for cats, uh, that would be super, super exciting. Um, don't know if it's possible, but I think it's a case of watch this space. Uh, something else I thought I'd just spend one minute talking about um, as well. I, I don't know if we're going to do this or not, but um, my main research interest is actually in the development of gene therapy um, treatments for canine diabetics. And um, we have managed to successfully treat three patients, um, treated four in total. Um, and what we've managed to do with those patients is we use a, a gene therapy technique to um, put the human insulin gene into the dog's liver. And uh, that insulin gene then will happily just start expressing insulin and it produces a background sort of maintenance level of insulin. And we haven't managed to make to take any of these patients to be permanently insulin free yet. We did manage it for nine weeks in one patient. But what we have done is we've managed to reduce the exogenous insulin dose requirement by up to 50 percent um, and also they made these patients physiologically much more stable um, so they even if they're hyperglycemic they tend not to develop particularly marked clinical signs and uh, this graph is it, it comes from the um uh, from like the original rodent work that my colleagues in singapore did um, where we took some uh, nod mice um, who become naturally diabetic you may be aware and we had three different doses of the gene vector. Um, and uh, the key thing is that the red lines um, at the top of the graph there are the diabetic treatments that had the sham. They just got injected with, with, with water and they remained diabetic and sadly died. Um, but when the key thing is when we used a medium dose, which was uh, five times 10 to nine viral vector particles per kilo, um, uh, so still large amounts of virus um, in the vector, the, the purple line at the bottom um, of the graph here is, is was the blood glucose um, on just from the ear prick um, sampling um, compared to healthy controls. And what you can see there is that um, within two weeks, actually within three weeks on average of being given the gene therapy, um, these mice went on to be completely normal and become non-diabetic again. Right? So on the basis of this study, we then repeated this in some diabetic rats and then we were able to get permission from the UK Home, home Office to do the work in, in some of my natural patients. And um, they did really well. So um, COVID has sort of put a stop to the study. Uh, but um, I'm hoping to restart this work in 2023. Whether it'll work in cats, I don't know, because dogs obviously by the time you see them are permanently diabetic. So um, having a permanent solution where the cat is, or the dog is making its own insulin is perfect. I'm a bit wary of doing it with a cat because if we did um, restore islet function, then there would be a chance of hypoglycemia, but it's something I'll hopefully tell you all about in a couple of years time. So I said the cornerstone number one of treatment was that was insulin. Now, cornerstone number two of treatment, though, absolutely crucial in feline patient, diabetic patients, is diet. And I first came across um, this uh, when I was at the Aquim Forum in, in, in Denver in 2001. I, I went to a presentation by a lady called Debbie Greco from Colorado State Uni, and uh, she was um, describing a study that had been uh, published earlier that year in Vet Therapeutics. Um, and the basic physiology goes like this. We know that cats are obligate carnivores, and actually cats physiologically will preferentially form carbohydrates by gluconeogenesis. But we have been feeding cats higher and higher carbohydrate containing diets over time. So if we could reverse that and feed a high protein diet and allow the cat to make the glucose it wants to, in inverted commas, to gluconeogenesis, and therefore have a low carbohydrate diet, then we may well be able to reverse some glucose toxicity. Um, we could improve satiety and we may be able to improve metabolic rate. So um, the study that, that, we, that was reported was that there were um, the, of the cats in the study, um, they were fed a high protein, they were actually fed feline growth, I think, from memory. Um, they had a high protein diet with low carbohydrates. And um, initially they were fed a high fiber diet just to stabilize them all. And then they moved on to the um, high protein diet for three months. And in that three month period, eight of the nine cats in the study had up to 50% reduction, um, on average, I think it's 50% reduction in insulin dose, and three developed diabetic remission. They stopped requiring exogenous insulin. So, and this was the, the, the first paper that said, well, hey, we could make a massive difference to these cats if we get the food in right. And then obviously the food manufacturers have all now developed um, their own diabetic diets um, for cats, and they make a massive difference. Um, and so I, I can't, 
I'm not here to bang the drum for any particular food manufacturer. Um, I'm not here to bang the drum about commercial diets over raw food or anything like that. What I would say is that if I had my cat was diabetic, I absolutely would never hesitate to feed it a diabetic control diet. Be that Hills MD, Purina um, DM, or, or the RCW diabetic diets. They're all excellent. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd probably use the Hills MD more than anything else. Um, but they really do help make a difference. Now, when it comes to that, I mean, dogs as well, we know how important a, a high fiber diet is, is in dogs. And we also have to feed dogs twice a day around about the time of each injection. Now, if we're trying to create gluconeogenesis, in theory, cats could graze feed as long as they're fed the right metabolic energy requirements. So work out how many calories they need for the weight you want them to be, and then feed that each day and do not exceed that. So it's about calorie control. But there are now some studies suggest that you get even better control if you feed them twice a day at around the same time as each injection. So again, think of watch this space. Twice a day feeding is probably what I'm going to move to. Um, but if you've got an owner who has to graze, let the cat graze food. As long as you calculate how many calories they must have and not exceed that, then that is probably crucial. So go to the protein story. Well, protein should be at least 40% of the diet on a metabolized energy basis. And, um, Anyone from our, from Royal Canada, I apologise, they didn't find the data you, but you know, but Hills have got their, their huge amount, that's 50%. Um, and we're not quite sure how much you should restrict the carbohydrate, but it should be probably definitely less than 12% of the metabolizable energy in the diet, possibly close to 10, which all the commercially available diets are. So, so we really do, we know that we can achieve a marked reduction um, in, uh, in insulin requirements by just changing the food. So um, cornerstone number two of treatment, and the two cornerstones really therefore treatment diabetic cats are number one, exogenous insulin, number two, an appropriate diet. So what are we aiming for? Well, in a diabetic dog, what we're aiming for obviously is just stability. Diabetic cats, we're aiming for cure. And I say cure, but we're trying to put them into diabetic remission is probably a better phrase because they're right, there is going to be some degree of permanent damage to the to eye. Um, how common is this? Well, it depends again on which study you read. But certainly, if you catch them early enough, the majority and, and are closely attentive enough with a good attentive owner and we're able to get the insulin dose right and the diet right, uh, the, probably fair to say the majority of diabetic cats can actually come off exogenous insulin at some point down the line, and that's often within a few months. Um, can be longer, but it, it, it certainly it's months, not years in most cases. So that's a real goal that most owners would want to work to achieve. Um, so it, we need them on side, we need to get them on board with us to make it happen. It may not happen because you and I, we don't have a way of yet of um, predicting whether beach islets are damaged beyond um, uh, return or not. And we need to make sure there's no other underlying pathologies. But as well as starting insulin injections, it's really important to start treatment, speeding a diabetic diet as soon as possible and get the owners to stick with it. Um, uh, and then really a case of monitoring. How, how do you monitor these patients? Uh, blood glucose curves, great if you can. Um, Interstitial fluid glucose monitoring, we'll come on to in, in the next slide. Fructosamine, I, I do use fructosamine though. Um, and I think the key thing with fructosamine though is to use it knowing the knowledge you have about its half-life of, of the, uh, of the um, Albumin. So for me, I would use fructosamine every three to four weeks, not less than that. Um, if you're doing fructose once every three months, it tells you what happened in the previous three weeks. It doesn't tell you what's happened in the previous three months. So for me, I'd use fructosamine probably once a month um, to see how we, um, what we're finding. If things are not working well, then we can think about changing the insulin to, to PZI or to, to glargine. Um, and then, or maybe going back to look at is there underlying ETA, uh, underlying comorbidity that we haven't thought about. Now, the key thing is though, how do you know if you've got diabetic remission? Well, the worrying thing is the cat is likely to go hypo. Um, and so, one of the key things with diabetic patients is to give your owners written instructions of what a hypoglycemic episode looks like and what they should do. Um, so, oral application of honey or glucostop or glucogel or something like that, um, doing that before they ring you. Um, but make sure they've got written instructions they can easily find. And if you do have a patient that does go into a, um, uh, a hyperglycemic episode, then I would just stop giving insulin. Um, continue with the diet and reassess the blood glucose from one, two, and if necessary, four weeks. If you find that patients maintained normal glycemia, 
then the key here is it's crucial to maintain the prescription diabetic diet and appropriate weight management because that if you um, let the weight become excessive again um, and or go to a, a more carbohydrate rich diet then there's a chance the patient will become diabetic again so um and also we need to avoid potentially diabetogenic medications so a bit of a problem here that in theory a very short course of prednisolone you'd expect it not to make a difference but there there are cases where um, short courses of glucocorticoids have been associated with um, triggering diabetes so it, where possible you need to avoid potentially diabetic um, diabetogenic medications but if you have a cat your patient has a hypo um although no one's probably panicking and you need to help them through that it's probably a case of going yay i think we're, we're uh, on the route to getting this cat back to being a, a cat that does not require insulin injections so how do we monitor well again I, I, um zero blood glucose curves is what i still would reach for um, in a dog i'm not sure the interstitial flu glucose monitoring unit is brilliant in dogs um i don't use um daily glucose uh, so in glucose monitoring urine at all I, in cats, I think that's really difficult. I think the first thing to say is look at the big picture. I think we all get really wound up and, and obsessed with what the glucose curve is, what the fluid, interstitial fluid glucose monitor we should use. Stop. Take a breath. What we need to do is we'll say, what's the cat's appetite? What's their weight doing? What's their activity level? Are they still polydipsic? And if we have a patient who's Appetite is improved, it is, is more back to normal, is more lively than it was, is no longer polyuric or polydipsic, then that big picture is probably the most important thing we know because we know we must have got it reasonably right. And then what we're doing is the monitoring to, to fine tune that treatment. Okay. So if you can do an ear prick or, or have a cut in if it's calm enough for a blood glucose curve in the hospital, um, then that would be lovely just to show what response. Um, but I think it has to be in the right patient. Well aware of that. Um, so in situ fluid glucose monitors, um, I've not actually used very much in cats, but I know a lot of colleagues have, but I have used a lot in the dogs, and I think they're brilliant. Um, but they are expensive. Um, so and certainly sometimes freestyle Libra is the one that I'm using most. There was a shortage of those uh, the um, sensors for a while, and I think whether you think human medicine should trump veterinary medicine is another matter, but uh, you know, they do work well. Um, and I think you remember that the, the sensors can work for up to a week or two weeks, depending on which, which unit you have. The one thing to remember about the interstitial fluid glucose monitors, though, is they don't work very well at low blood glucose. So if you have a reading of, say, in my experience, of less than 2.2, .2, it could be anywhere from 0 to 2.2. .2. So just be very careful how you interpret that low blood glucose because they, they lose their sensitivity in low, uh, low range. So I don't if you haven't seen one, um, I've used two main ones. This is a thing called a Dexcom, G, uh, Dexcom unit, which is a little sub-Q probe. And I apologize, these pictures are pictures of dogs, not cats. And what this does is it, there's a reader unit you buy, and this does a Bluetooth message to the reader every five minutes. So you have a genuine real-time glucose curve that then stores this down to your laptop um, in, in real time. Most people, though, I think we certainly UK have used using this Freestyle Libra. Um, and uh, you can download the app on your phone and actually as the, as the vet you can I still have get received messages of what my patients blood glucoses are um, and put it just sub cues as administration device the key of these is that you do need to make sure they're dressed or bandaged in and so, so the cat can't scratch them out so we normally would put a little um, sort of a soft band and then a light vet wrap over the top to make sure you can and you hold the reader over the top of it whenever you want to make a reading and it still works and there's a dress in place so Here's a, a lovely um, canine patient of mine called Ella, um, who placed the sensor, put a little um, water dressing at the top, and then dressed it. And then we can just hold the sensor at the top, and it tells you how long the sensor has got as well. So, uh, really great little bits of kit. Um, not as easy using cats, but certainly better than using blood glucose curves. So, very briefly, if, um, just in, in case, uh, last sort of 10 minutes or so, with um, what about in, in diabetic ketoacidosis? Well, th these patients appear the same as they do in, in dogs. They will be much more seriously unwell. They will be often dehydrated. They may be vomiting. Um, and you'll find ketonuria and glucosuria. Um, so uh, and sometimes in history, you'll find that they were diabetic and they'll be stressful, like I say, that's precipitated this. So the way we're going to, um, we may, um, if you can smell the ketone breath, and it's lovely, but key thing is just to spin down uh, a blood or, or have a urine sample and, and the little dipsticks for um, uh, urine also work on serum 
which they've been proper spotted by spinal serum on the urine dipstick the ketones it goes purple then you've got ketosis um and how are we going to diagnose it well we're going to find they're often dehydrated so you're going to have a pre-renal azotemia you're going to find ketone urea and hyperglycemia um and uh, we almost certainly will have some elevated alcohol and um, alt key one here that we need to keep an, a watch like a hawk is potassium um if you remember to maintain electrical neutrality when you have a, an acidotic patient, um, you often will ex, you extract, uh, you move uh, hydrogen ions intracellularly in exchange for potassium, and that is then excreted by the distal convoluted tubule of the kidney. So these patients um, will often be potassium depleted. What insulin does is insulin then drives potassium intracellularly. So as soon as you start injecting insulin, there is a real risk that your potassium will drop and drop very, very quickly, particularly when they're also going to have these cation fluids. So if I have a, a diabetic cat um, that I have uh, hospitalized, um, I believe it's ketotic, and we're giving it soluble insulin, um, either a CRI or every hour, I'll be measuring the potassium four times a day um, because it can drop that much that quickly, even with supplementation on board. So be very, very mindful to monitor. So we're going to rehydrate. Um, we will, how do you stop the ketogenesis? You stop ketogenesis using insulin. And the key thing in DKA patients is that the intermediate actin, prosine, or can insulin will, will not be effective. You need to use neutral insulin intravenously. That's what I would do. Either 0.1 units per kilo every hour as a little pulse IV or as a CRI. Um, uh, and what you want to see is that we want, you will still see ketones in the bloodstream and urine for many days. What we want to see is that you start to get a response of your glucose. So you manage to get a normal glycemia. As soon as you get that, you can then move to uh, an exogenous intermediate acting insulin, get the diet working, um, and those patients would normally be okay. Um, as with dogs, diabetic ketoacidotic patients are prone to getting um, sepsis and infection, particularly bacterial translocation across the gut wall. So although I'm a huge fan of antibiotic stewardship and, and uh, drive to lower our antibiotic use, this is a situation where I would give systemic antibiotics for the beta lactam, um, kermoxiclab um, with, with uh, metronidazole uh, to give some broad spectrum cover in that first three to five days while we're just treating the patient in hospital. So that is fundamentally how I treat my diabetics, um, diet and insulin. Um, now, those of you, you may have read that there are some oral treatments. I'll, I'll just quickly whiz through what these oral treatments are because there are some oral treatments that have been described for use in the cat. As well as I don't use them anymore. Um, but if you've got a situation where you cannot inject insulin at all, um, uh, then this might be not these may be options you could think about. And the three I'm going to briefly talk about glipizide, metformin, and um, acrodose. So glipizide is 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 a drug that um, actually works by stimulating further insulin production from functional beta islets. And there's some papers in its, in its use from um, sort of 15 or 20, 25 years ago. Um, and some cats will respond. Um, and what you're doing in those patients is you're, there's enough beta islet function to just overcome the glucose toxicity. But I said in the pathophysiology section that one of the problems of um, diabetes is we're working the beta islets too hard. So giving a medication that makes them work even harder still has always struck me as being slightly counterintuitive. So um, I have used glipizide in the distant past, but I, I have to say I personally wouldn't use it now. If I was going to use an oral treatment, I would use metformin. Uh, metformin is a, a medication that, uh, by seems to work by magical mystery, increases the peripheral sensitivity of insulin to insulin, sorry, of peripheral tissues. So that makes more sense that you can use the insulin that you've got um, to be more effective. Um, again. Probably though not as effective at doses that cats can tolerate. It doesn't seem very well tolerated by cats. I think if you could give bigger doses, um, then we may see this to be more effective. But it is GI toxic in, in the majority of cats it's given to. Um, uh, Richard Nelson um, from UC Davis published the, the best paper I'm aware of in, in this. And um, we're still not many cats in it. And um, uh, although he did show that they responded it, and with the dosages that were working, it's, I'm not a huge fan of metformin either. Um, now, a really interesting paper that came out, I think, eight, eight years ago, maybe more, um, used a, a thing called alpha glucostase inhibitor, which is a brush border enzyme, and it inhibits the brush border enzyme, and therefore slows the absorption of glucose. So the theory being, if you're sticking with a high, uh, high carbohydrate food, um, 
then you could actually reduce the effect of that carbohydrate on the circulation. And this was actually, um, oh God, it was 2003, wow, it was ages ago. Um, so um, this, so it's, it's, it's oral supplement, and uh, what they found was that it did work really, really well. Um, that, uh, that all the patients in the, in the trial um, had lowered exogenous entry requirement, actually some have stopped requiring each and every day. So I've always been interested in ECOBOS. Having said that, the question mark for me is we've got really good quality prescription diets available. And I think they probably say achieve the same effect, albeit through a different route. So I wouldn't use any of these three options over a really good prescription diet. So in my treatment summary, um, you need to work out how many calories you want the cat to have based on the weight you want it to be. Provide that probably in two equal, equal daily feeds at the same time as you're giving either can insulin, get insulin, um, or prosing. Um, you're going to give that, um, start that both as soon as possible. Feed a high, uh, um, oh, sorry, there's a typo there, isn't there? Um, I'm not so worried about high fiber diets, but it certainly should be a low carbohydrate and high protein diet. Um, so, one of the ones that's available, and for, so for fair here, raw canning, Waltham's diabetic diet would also be appropriate. Combine that with exogenous insulin and monitor the big picture and the clean path data if you possibly can, but make sure your owners understand about hypoglycemic episodes or what to do. And I think overall conclusion, therefore, and which I hope has been a, a useful talk, is that feline diabetes is much more common than many clinicians think, uh, particularly this in the UK. It's a multifactorial disease, but breed and obesity um, are, or, and in, inappropriate diet are almost certainly the major things that cause it. I personally now do test for acromegaly, even if they don't appear to be acromegalic. And the key take home though is that if you can really get on top of this, diabetic treatment can be hugely successful, hugely rewarding, and aiming in many patients to achieve a diabetic remission, although it's not always possible for the young. So, and the way to achieve it is prescription diet and the use of intermediate acting insulin injections. So that's my last slide. Um, Danny, I hope you haven't been called in. Um, but, uh, so, uh, but thank you very much indeed for asking me to speak today. Um, thank you for all of you uh, who are supporting the Vets for Ukraine. I think the link is somewhere down there um, for the Just Giving page. Um, or if I'm well aware that uh, we are aware uh, in the Vets for Ukraine group that not everyone uh, wishes to um, donate to the British Red Cross. So we ask that um, if we respect that if that is your view um, but please could you donate to the national charity in your own country um, uh, to we need to do all we can to help um, our brothers and sisters and colleagues and friends in ukraine um, this help this horrendous situation we are thinking of you we're with you and we will try to do all we can to help and lastly whether you're listening live um, or on the recordings thank you very very much indeed for your time it's a, always a, a privilege to be able to speak to colleagues in our wonderful profession Albeit the underlying reason for me being here this evening, I wish it wasn't in existence. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, that's me. So, Daniel Paola, are you there? Have we lost the line? No, I had my microphone on. Well, yeah. talking, oh. talking and talking. I, I was suddenly looking like a hypothyroid cat then, Danny. I was suddenly getting a bit. I, just, no, no, I was just, uh, I just <laughs> the microphone. So what, what I was saying, thank you so much for your presentation. And I was saying, I admire you guys, medics, because you can talk hours and hours and hours about things like diabetes and for us, to, for as simple-minded surgeons <laughs> oh, diabetes insulin and that's it yeah, so yeah. you know we are far more pragmatic and anyway thank i'm sure i'm sure that we have um on the other side of the camera people uh, interested in uh, in asking you questions but because uh, there is a bit of a delay between the uh, the live and the questions Okay. Uh, I, I just in uh, whilst we are waiting for the questions, uh, I just launch um, like our usual message in a bottle so sure. that we can share some more uh, new projects uh, around the world. Yeah. 
so now now that I'm a bit sad after this uh, message by Sting and looking at the eyes of the little girl. So our message in a bottle is um, wants to focus on uh, Paul Squad and uh, his CEO Mark Body. Uh, Paul Squad is an organization based in Cambridge and they are currently offering any veterinarian advice advices to uh, people from Ukraine. So basically they can call uh, Paul Squad for any kind of medical advices and the call is for free and they are happy to help. Also, uh, let allow me to remind the USAVA, so the Ukrainian Small Animal Veterinary Association, uh, who uh, is promoting many different initiatives to collect donations and uh, to help our uh, Ukrainian veterinary colleagues um, in, in Ukraine and also uh, in Romania, in Poland. So if you don't want to, or you are not happy to donate, um, to our link, uh, just go on Facebook and look for the USAVA Facebook page and you can find, uh, you will find many links where you can donate. And so basically just, uh, it, it does not matter um, where you donate your money. Uh, the important is to donate something because every little helps and we can change things all together all together and don't forget the t-shirt let's do the vets for ukraine 2022 revolution let's do the t-shirt and wear it and take a picture and send it to uh, and post it on your uh, social media uh, so hannah Boto, thank you very much for a brilliant talk rob so can you read the comments I, I'm no, I'm still got my Paolo. Can we um, stop sharing the screen, please? Because I can't see the I can't see the comments. So I think you need to do it. So if do you, okay, if you press on ask. Okay, now I can see. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see. So this is a Hannah comment. Thank you, Hannah. That's very kind of you. Um, and then I'm sure there is, I saw another couple of questions here. Yeah. This is um, uh, this is a question from an Italian colleague called Paola Pilagiano, who is a friend of mine. Okay. So we have done uh, the oncology course together. So, Rob, how do you feel can insulin works in cats? Many times I have difficulties in obtaining a good control with this insulin. Actually, my preferred insulin is, I don't know how to pronounce this, to, 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 yeah. to sure. what do you think about it? So um, I, I'll, I'll say now I've, I've never used Tugio. Um, uh, my understanding is it's a long acting insulin similar to PZI. Um, so uh, the answer would be, I find can insulin generally works fairly well but I know there are some patients it doesn't work well in, and there are some colleagues who would rather use either Prozinc, probably last slightly longer, or the Glargine. Um, Glargine certainly seems to have a more persistent uh, duration of action. So I think using a long-acting insulin is fine. Um, the key is to get as much glycemic control as possible. The worry about using a long-acting insulin is that if the duration of action is more than 12 hours and you keep giving dose upon dose, you can have a cumulative excess and there would be a risk of causing a hypo as a result of the insulin rather than it being into diabetic remission. So the beauty of using uh, Prozinc, Vetsulin or um, Caninsulin is that they don't generally last more than eight to 12 hours. Um, so you don't need to worry too much, but if you've got a long acting insulin, I would do a glucose curve if possible just to show the duration of action, that there's no risk of a cumulative dose effect. Um, so I don't have a problem, I think it's a great idea. And, and you're not alone. Uh, I know some colleagues who don't like and I, I, I found it to be effective, um, but it's, it doesn't work in every patient. And if it's not working, using a longer acting insulin is almost certainly what's needed. Okay, 
Do you want me to go? So I can see the question, Danny. Do you want to read that? Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah. I don't know who this person is. It just says Facebook user. So hello, Facebook user. Um, because the probability of emission depends on the best control achieved in the short term, why don't you choose a more longer lasting inching like Blargene first? Is it for legal concerns? Uh, the answer to that question is yes, I'm afraid it is. Um, in the UK uh, and Europe, we're restricted by the Cascade legislation which dictates that if there is a licensed product, we have to use that licensed product first, and we cannot use a non-licensed product unless we've used the license to prove it works. Oh, it doesn't work. And we cannot reject the use of um, uh, uh, a licensed product on the basis of cost. So if I had my choice, I have to also probably would use Glargene first. When I've used Glargene, it's always worked really, really well. Um, but uh we can't use it as a first line choice because of the cascade regulations that we have in the uk so it's can insulin or pro zinc are the only choices you have to go for and while i'm actually on that one the other thing i have had a couple of cats come over from the states um who on human lente insulin i found them to be brilliantly controlled um, and found a really good response to human lente um it is they're molecularly almost identical to feline um, but I don't know. I think again, if you're in a country where human lente is available, then that would also be an excellent choice to, to run with. But it's legal concerns that we we don't use glargine as a first line. Thank you, Rob. Paula, thank you for your question. By the way, I saw I, just a message to Paula Pilagiano. I saw your T-shirt that you have posted, and it's it's beautiful. Thank you for doing that. Ciao, ciao, Paula. Uh, Paolo, have we got any other questions for Rob? Yeah. No. It means that everything was clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've all, they've all gone to sleep, then. Maybe, maybe they've missed that. <laughs> um, so, yes, no, sorry, because I'm confused. Paolo, you say yes or no? Ah, okay. We don't have questions, but uh, we we would like to uh anticipate um uh, uh, webinar for tomorrow if i don't remember wrong because i don't have the calendar uh now by me it will be uh, jane ladlow yes with uh boas top tips for diagnosis and management so we will uh, wait for you tomorrow and yes please do share our links and donate 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 to www.justgiving.com slash bets for uk thank you very much for your attention rob thanks so much for joining well, us thank uh, you so much it's really nice to a pleasure to to see you again to uh, and to talk to you again and i'm sure i will see you in different in different thank occasions you. again thank you, Danny. and can i just say on behalf of all of us thank you so much for everything you and paolo are doing it's an amazing initiative yeah, i'm so proud again as i said to you before i wish we weren't having to do this but i'm so proud to be part of it um you're making a massive difference so thank you from all of us um, very much indeed it's a lot of work though and actually before we go because um we always mention paolo 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 uh, actually is me is my other half and is doing like a, a, a an exceptional work he's always behind the camera but he's the person that is organizing everything and putting together uh, all the information that we pass you pass to you on so paolo is a uh, um is really important in this initiative so thank you paolo and yeah <laughs> okay everyone thank you bye thank you for tonight and see you tomorrow bye 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 rob bye bye bye, bye everyone thank bye, you bye bye, bye.